I'll be continuing this morning a series I started a, a couple of months ago now on sound doctrine. I believe this is a day and a time in which we need sound doctrine more than ever. Amen. And uh, today is going to be a, a very interesting portion of scripture to look at because when we look at sound doctrine and the last days. Sound doctrine and the last days. We'll read from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through verses 3. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, let's stand as we read together from God's word, giving honour and preference to the word of God. For it alone is our authority and no man. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Amen. You may be seated. We trust and believe the Lord will add his blessing to reading of his perfect and his infallible word, as you have it before you uh, in the authorised King James Bible. Amen. Thank God this morning, there is a last days. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, many times when I used to drive in America, and I used to have my three kids, and they were smaller, and uh, they'd sit in the back of the car, and sometimes we had a bigger car, and sometimes we had a smaller car, and many times we heard two things from the back of the car. Number one, I need the toilet. Number two, are we there yet? And uh, I heard that many, many, many times. Are we there yet? And uh, thank God, these things have an end. Amen. There is an end. The world thinks it's going to go on and on and on and on forever, amen. But the Bible is very clear that there will be an end. That there will be a latter times. Now, before I get into the message this morning... There are some things that are good to understand about the last or the latter times. First of all, there is the biblical view of governments. Now, every single uh, politician I've ever heard of or have met has the unbiblical view of government. Most governments, in fact all governments, most politicians, most leaders, most educators, most philosophers, most philanderers, all have the wrong view of government. Because every politician you ever hear will start out with their, their speech by saying, you know, things are going to get better. <laughs> That's not a biblical view. Things are not going to get better. In fact, things are only going to get worse. Every politician, I know in America we have an election with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And here we have Theresa May uh, just being made the new prime minister. And they're all talking about how we're going to make the world a better place. How the world is going to come together through the European Union, through the United Nations, through this, that and another, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And we're going to make the world better. Unfortunately, that's not the truth. A very clear biblical view of government and the world is the fact that this world is going to get worse until it reaches, if you like, in the musical terms, a crescendo and there will be far worse to come. People in America complain about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and I said to one, uh, to one person, I said, you know, it's like choosing between the beast and the false prophet. You know, they're not good choices. But, you know, as bad as they are, there will be an antichrist, there will be a beast, and there will be a false prophet, and there will be a tribulation in which this world will seek uh, for goodness but find nothing but judgment. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll find that many judgments fall on the land, on the sea, on the mountains. The people will, will hide in the mountains. They'll, they'll call upon the rocks to hide them, not from politics, but from the face of him who is coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said he was coming back. Turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And I want to show you a couple of verses from there. About the promise. A few weeks ago we preached on this. The promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the fact that he is coming back. John chapter 14 and verse 1 says this. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Or as it says in the broad Scots Bible, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't they say, I would have told you. Verse 3, and, I, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. So the fact is, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, not an angel, not a, any a cherubim or seraphim or any of these things, he said himself is coming back. Now praise the Lord for that, amen. The Lord is coming back. But in order to understand the, the sound doctrine about the last days, we have to look briefly, and I do mean briefly, at some of the viewpoints that Christians and religious organizations hold towards the, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one view which is called the amillennial viewpoint. And in the amillennial viewpoint, everything is spiritualized. The Lord might say, well, this is a tree, but really it's not a tree. It's a, it's a, it's a bag of bananas. Because everything is not what it is, it's something else. That's the amillennial view. And the amillennialists believe that there will be no, and the word a in front of a word means no, or, or won't be. Uh, they believe there won't be a millennium as such, but that they will bring the kingdom, and you'll hear this in the Church of Scotland very often, they will bring the kingdom of God to earth, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of Christ. They believe that mankind is going to make the world such a good place that the Lord is going to look down from heaven and say, that's wonderful, I think I'll come down and reign. That's the amillennial view. It does not take a literal view of scripture. It does not take a literal view of prophecy. It simply means that nothing is literal. And it has what's, you'll find it many times in, in Reformation theology, and uh, what's called replacement theology. Now stay with me. I'm, I'm, I, I've got some good doctrine here. And some good things to know. Reformation theology. Which is basically the church of Scotland. States that Israel is done. And the church is now Israel. And there will not be a literal kingdom given to Israel. But the church will have all the blessings and promises given to Israel. There's only one thing wrong with that. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the 144,000, if you, in fact, let's turn over to Revelation chapter 7. Let's look at that so you can see for yourselves from the word of God. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And uh, I want you to read the verse... Number four, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. And on and on and down it goes, it mentions the 12 tribes of Israel. Every one of them is a Jewish group. Every one. Now in the tribulation, as we'll get to this in a few minutes, we live in what's called the dispensation of grace. When the rapture happens, that's when the Lord returns according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When the Lord comes and takes his, his church out of this world, the Holy Spirit will leave this world as we have known it. And you'll enter a time of tribulation. And if you read from Revelation 3 onwards to the end of Revelation until chapter 22, there is not a single mention of the church. Not one. Doesn't exist. Because in the tribulation, God is not dealing with the church. He's dealing with Israel. And only Israel. Mm -hmm. And through Israel, Gentiles are blessed. Because 144,000 are going to go and preach the gospel throughout the world. And they're going to get many converts and many people are going to get saved. And then they get saved by faith. But the consequence of believing that is that many of them are going to get their heads cut off. Many of them are going to be martyred. Some people say all of them, and I think most of them, but there will be some going into the millennium. But many people who are there will have a consequence, is that the beast and the false prophet and the Antichrist will war against them and kill them. I used to have a friend who was a Russellite, they call themselves the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
And uh, when I was a young Christian, I used to walk to school. Believe it or not, I used to walk two miles there and two miles back every day. <sighs> Don't tell the social workers, they'll have a fit. But I used to walk down, and we'd walk down as a group, and one of the group was a, this Russellite. And I used to tell him, I said, you know, just wait through tribulation, and you can believe them because you'll see things the way I see them. But you know what? I wouldn't want to wait to the tribulation, you say. Because you think it's hard to live as a Christian today. You wait to the tribulation, amen. It's going to be far worse. So the amillennial or the reformation and replacement theology says that nothing is literal. And then there's a premillennial and pre-tribulational view. And that's the view that, that I believe in. And that basically takes a literal view of Bible prophecy and an imminent hope of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. An imminent, that means he could come at any minute. I believe the Lord could come today, man. Amen. I believe any minute. And the Lord says uh, uh, he'll come as a thief in the night. The Bible says he's going to come with, 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 with the voice of the archangel. And the world's going to be unaware of that. So we believe in the literal fulfillment of prophecy. That means a, you know, a, a shovel's a shovel, a tree's a tree. When the, when, when the Lord says something is this, it is this. And we believe in an imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's another viewpoint, and that's called the post-tribulational view. And that simply means that they believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will return after the tribulation and that believers today will go through the tribulation period. Now, there are two things wrong with this. First of all, it destroys the doctrine of imminency. Because you can't believe the Lord is coming back imminently if you have to go through at least seven years of tribulation. How can you believe in imminency? How can, you, how can you believe that with the Lord when he says he'll come as a thief in the night and he'll steal away his, his people and he'll come imminently? Paul talked about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed that they were coming imminently. Well, how can you believe that if you've got seven years of tribulation? Right. Can't. So the post-tribulational believes that he's coming imminent, uh, uh, after the tribulation and that the church will go through the tribulation. Well, as I said in Revelation, from chapter 3 to the end of the book, there's no mention of the church, not once. It talks about believers. It talks about those who are saved. It talks about those who have been martyred. It talks about those who have been faithful, but not one squeak of a word about the church. There is no church from Revelation 3 to Revelation 22. The reason why is because the church is not in tribulation. The church is in heaven. Amen. So the, the, the post-tribulational and premillennial believe that the church will go through the, the, the tribulation. And then there's another one which is premillennial. That means the Lord's coming back before the millennium. And mid-tribulational. That means that we're going to, that, that, that some people believe that the church is going to go through a bit of the tribulation and then halfway through that they're going to be raptured out. So again, it destroys the doctrine of imminency. Because how can you believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ if you've got to go through at least three and a half years of tribulation? And the Bible is clear about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about he's going to come. Uh, in fact, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'd like you to see for yourself the scripture. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality. Uh, again, if you go to First Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul talks about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for, for, for his people, and he talks about, and he says to them, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But wait a minute, if you're going through the tribulation, how is that a comfort? How is that a comfort to know that I'm going to get heavy? Where's the comfort in that? Where's the imminency in that? If, if I know I'm, I'm going to go through part of the tribulation, where's the comfort in that? You see, the doctrine of imminency and the comfort of the return of the Lord is something that is integral to 
our belief about the tribulation in the last days. So those are the four main views. There are other kind of different views, but there are four main views. There's the amillennial, the premillennial pre-trib, the premillennial post-trib, and the premillennial mid-trib. And if you believe the Bible is the word of God, if you believe the literal fulfillment of the word of God, then you will tend to believe the premillennial pre-tribulational view where the Lord's going to come back and take his church out of this world before the tribulation. So that's just a basic, very quick runover of, of prophecy. Uh, we call it eschatology, but there's a lot more than that, but that's just a wee foretaste if you like. So first of all, get back to our scripture in 1, uh, 1, Thessalonians, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now the first thing I want you to notice here is the split from the truth. You know, when I was growing up, you used to say, make like a banana, split. You know, that simply means you run away, you get out of there as quick as possible. And the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I has found that when they lied to, to, to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4. But the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now I want you to notice the, the expressness. The expressness. I don't know if that's even the word. But the expressness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants us to know something. Uh, Jude talked about that. And, and, and Jude had it. He was going to write of the common salvation. But he says it, it was necessary. To write of the things he was going to write. The spirit speaketh expressly. This is important. That in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith. That's where we are right now. I remember growing up in the 70s. In the 80s and the 90s. and It was hard to be a Christian. It was. But not as hard as it is now. And you know that the thing that makes it hard the more than anything else are, are, are those who call themselves Christians. Amen? Those who should know the Bible is the word of God but have turned from it and departed from it. Some shall depart from the faith. Before the return of the Lord there will be a falling away from the faith. There will be those who run away. We were talking, uh, uh, Brother Daniel and I were out this week and we met a lady who used to go to church in this area and uh, she was telling us how she ran. The, the, she got saved in this church and, and the guy was, was a guy who, who believed the Bible and preached the Bible and she talked about how that she went to this church and that church and this church and she's now in a liberal Baptist Union church. <coughs> and she said, telling us, oh yes, I've, I've been around. You're, I think to myself, why did she run away from the truth? reason why she ran away from the truth because she didn't want to hear the truth. You know why people leave a, a, a Bible-believing church? Because they don't like what they hear. Amen. Because humanly speaking, the human part of us does not want to hear the word of God. Right. Uh, God talks about in the book of uh, the Old Testament how that Israel was stiff-necked. You're not telling me what to do. I will have no man rule over me reason why people don't want to hear the truth is because man and pride comes first. We see a description of how some will depart from the truth. They will depart from the truth giving heed to seducing spirits. They want to have teachers who want to tell them things they want to hear. Oh how there are so many churches who are going on today and having services today and saying lovely things. You know the world really is not such a bad place. Sin really isn't sin. And the devil, well, you know, if you get to Rome, he's really not that bad. People have itching ears, the Bible says. And they want to hear good things. That's why, you know, churches that have praise bands and dancing groups and, and all the rest of it are packed full because they like what they hear. The Bible says that people will turn aside to truth, from truth, to fables. Fables. Turn over to uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 27 through verse 31. We have some warnings here that Paul gave to the Ephesian elders about what will happen. 
Acts chapter 20 and verse 27 through verse 21. And I, I like where Paul starts off by here and here. here. This, this would be my heart's desire. If I, had a, if, I, if I had a Bible verse that I would want to have, this would be one of them. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You know how the wolves come in? Dressed as sheep. Amen. Amen. And also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space... Of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul told the Ephesian elders that once he departed, there was going to be grievous wolves. You know what a wolf is? An animal that hunts to kill. You know what a pastor is? A person who leads the flock to feed. Paul was a pastor. He was an overseer. He was someone who wanted to edify and feed the sheep. But he said, look out, there's coming wolves. If you go back over church history, you will find that, that uh, Christians, and especially those that call Anabaptists, or the Polycans, the Waldensians, and Ovations, and many other different names that Baptists have been called down from the time of Christ, have been persecuted and murdered and martyred by many different churches. By the Catholic Church. And by the Protestant church. Amen. John Calvin killed a guy called Servetus because he believed in baptism. That's nice, isn't it? John Calvin did. So there will be grievous wolves. I've heard it estimated that 50 million Baptists were killed by the Catholic church prior to the Reformation. And then tens of thousands after the Reformation. There's a book called The Martyr's Mirror about that thick. And has the, the details and the, 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 the records the events that happened to God's people down through the ages. How they were martyred for their faith. Grievous wolves. And not only that. Perverse people. When we think of perverse, we think of perversion. And that means they're changing things. And we see that going on all over the world in so-called Christendom today. By people who have changed the Bible, the word of God. You know, if, if you don't like what the Bible says, just pick another version. You'll find one you like. The so-called Russellites the, and the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses didn't like the, the authorized version, so they came up with their own. The Mormons came up with their own. They talk about their two sects. Well, you know, it's good to have the Bible, but we have the, the sick of the Book of Mormon. Perverse things. Amen. So, they were warned... By Paul, the Ephesian elders. But Paul warned the church at Thessalonica also. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 2. And verses 1 through 3. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. And verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So there's the falling away that was a warning. There's going to be a falling away. Peter did the same thing. Turn over to Second Peter, chapter 2. And verses 1 through 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And verses 1 through 2. But there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Who brively shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that brought them. Bought them. And bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So when these false teachers come in, they bring in perverseness and they speak evil of the word of truth. 
You know the reason why they speak even the word of truth? is because they want to be the authority, not the word of truth. That's why you'll find in many churches, in the vast majority of churches today, you'll find some guy in the front saying, <coughs> in the original Greek, <coughs> in the original Hebrew, <coughs> which of course you can't read, but, but me being a doctor and, and uh, studying seminary or, or cemetery, uh, I've learned these things. Uh, you know, I know better than you. I'm your authority. Garbage. Amen. The word of God's authority. That's right. You don't need to learn Greek. You don't need to learn Hebrew. If you like a little Greek, you can buy a kebab. Amen? <laughs> or, or, or as they say in America, a gyro. But you don't need Greek and Hebrew. You simply need to read the word of truth and you'll have it there. Amen. That's what they do. Jude also warned in, in Jude chapter 3. In fact, let's turn to Jude chapter... Uh, no, there's no chapter. Jude 3 and 4. About he, how he warned there would be false teachers coming in at the last days, and, and this is how you know it's the last days, by the way, because there will be a multitude and a uh, multiplying of false teachers. Uh, Jude 3 and 4 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, first I note on that, earnestly contend. Well, you can be a Christian, but don't be contentious. Don't, 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 don't be so narrow-minded as to believe the Bible. How can you earnestly contend without being contentious? That doesn't mean we have to be nasty, but we're to stand up for the truth, amen? amen. People come up to you and say, is homosexuality a sin? Yes. Is, is, alcohol, is being a drunkard a sin? Yes. Is being an adulterer a sin? Yes. Well, you know, you have to understand the circumstances. And, you know, it, it, they didn't mean to. Garbage. It's a sin, amen. The Bible says it's sin. So it's sin. Amen. But uh, verse 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness, that's just lustfulness, uh, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So even Jude and Paul and Peter and the Lord warned in the last days there's going to be false teachers. And some are going to depart from the faith to follow these false teachers. That's the first thing about the last days. The split from the truth. But not only that, we find that there is a reign of seducing terrors. Uh, going back to our scripture verse in First Timothy chapter 4. Now the spirit, I may not get past verse 1, but it's a good thing, amen. Now the spirit speaketh, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. You know what it means to be seduced? It means to be turned from righteousness to unrighteousness. We talk about if a man or a woman seduces someone, that they're taking them from something that's right into something that's sinful. So we know about these spirits that they're going to turn those who went to church, because they depart from the faith, from righteousness to unrighteousness. Seducing spirits. We live in a world that is spiritual. Amen. We live in a world, and Paul, Paul talked about in Ephesians, how he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You meet someone who comes up to you, and I, I was thinking a few weeks ago, uh, Brother Adam was down in the center of Plaza, when someone came up and threw a tin of white paint over him. You know who did that? It wasn't the guy who threw the paint. It was the spirit behind the guy. The spirit who whispered to the guy and said, you know, you should take that tin of paint and throw it over that person. We live in a world of seducing spirits. Do I believe in evil spirits? Absolutely. Come along here on Friday night and have the stupid uh, uh, you know, seances and all the rest of it. Seducing spirits. Evil spirits. Paul talks about taking up the shield of faith. Amen. Wherewith he shall be able to quench the, the, the fiery darts of the wicked. You need that, uh, that shield of faith. Because the devil will come. Why is it you? Oftentimes when you pray. I don't know about you, but you'll get down and you'll kneel down and you pray, and these thoughts will come into your head. Oh, you need to go and do this. Or this, that, and the other. Where do you think that comes from? 
When you pray or when you read the Bible, there are devils and demons who are going to throw fiery darts. Let's get Brother Michael likes to play darts. I'll have to think about this. A wee demon with a dart. Get that bit right. Right there. Seducing spirits. We live in a spiritual world. Our battles are not only with the physical, our battles are with the spiritual. Paul, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know there are many Christians who are ignorant of the fact that the devil has got them exactly where he wants them. I was going to be singing a song today, but I couldn't get all the words to it. It's a great old song, and most of the songs I know are older songs, I guess, but uh, it's, it's called Excuses. I don't know if you know that one, Brother Daniel, excuses. It goes, excuses, excuses, you'll hear them all the time. Uh, it, it, it says, when people come to know the Lord, the devil always uses, loses. But to keep them folks away from church, I'll present excuses. Excuses, excuses. You'll hear them all the time. And you know, a lot of times the, the devil will come along and, and you know, well, you know, you're awful tired this Sunday. You know, that, that preacher preached a long, long time. And, uh, you know, you could use the extra rest. Huh? Read, read your Bible. Read your Bible today. Oh, you know you've worked really hard. You know it's it, it's kind of late. Why don't you just leave that for tomorrow? Excuses, excuses. You know who brings those excuses? Seducing spirits. Amen. Amen. We live in a spiritual world. We live in a world that that, that these seducing spirits will attack. They they, they they reign in this world. We find in our in our in our scripture text here it says they they forbid. To eat certain meats. They forbid to marry. They mess people's lives up. Oh you can't do this. Oh you can't do that. Oh you shouldn't eat this. Oh you shouldn't marry this person. A reign of seducing terrors. But not only that. I want you to see Satan's statutes. The last part of verse 1 of chapter 4. Verse 1 Timothy says. Now the spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, the Bible says that the word of God is quick and powerful and is good for doctrine. Amen. And doctrine is simply the study of what the Bible says. There are doctrines we believe. For instance, we believe that Jesus came, that he was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross, that he rose again on, on the third day. And it wasn't a Friday he was crucified. Uh, he was actually a Wednesday. Those are doctrines. But did you know the devil has doctrines too? Amen. The devil has doctrines too. And they, spe they, 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 they come from the, the very attack that Dave, the, the, the devil had in the Garden of Eden with Eve. When he said to Eve, Ye hath God said. Is it really true? Is the Bible really true? Is it really true that there's only one way to heaven? I mean, that's very narrow-minded of you, don't you think? You know, there are many ways to God. I mean, you know, the, the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Hare Krishnas, the, the, the Catholics, the Protestants. You know, we're all making our way in the same direction. The right. But they're all going to hell. Because the Bible says, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Right? Narrow is the road that leads to heaven. And the devil says, is it really true that... Jesus is the only way. Is it really true that the only way to heaven is through Jesus? Turn over to John chapter 14. And let's find out what Jesus said about this very, very thought. John chapter 14, you probably know it. It's a very one good verse to, to memorize. John chapter 14 verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How many go to the Father apart from Jesus? No man. One road or one door and only one and yet its sides are two. Inside and outside and which side are you? There's only one way heaven and that's through Jesus. It's not the Baptist way. It's not the Brethren way. It's not the Pentecostal way. It's the Bible way and that's through Jesus. Amen. Only one door and that's through Jesus. 
I, I don't know if you saw on the news today, I was watching His Unholiness, the Pope, is in Poland right now. And he's walking around and they're all singing his praises. And there was a big picture of this long-haired hippie Jesus on the side. And uh, you know he was talking about uh, all God's children are going to heaven. Garbage. Only the saved are going to heaven. Only those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour are going to heaven. Uh, I said, Brother Daniel, there's, there's, a, there's a, um, Mother Teresa's nuns uh, has a wee door over there. Uh, not very far from here. And uh, I, I noticed it when I, uh, many years ago. And I, I passed the tracks. And I saw that Mother Teresa's nuns. And they all went in there. And they're, they're poor out for the whole rest of them. You know what I did? I'd like to tell you about the Bible. But we're nuns. I'd like to tell you about the Bible. Amen. I'd like to tell you you can see. And know for sure you're going to have. Oh no one can know for sure. I can. First John chapter 5 verse 22 says. But these things are written that you might know. That you have eternal life. But the devil has doctrines. Oh, no one can know. Jesus isn't the only way. Surely not. Some of the doctrines of the devil is, is you can trust any religion to get to heaven in any way because we're all going there eventually. As lo- the devil's doctrines, as long as you live a good life, you'll be fine. Devil's doctrines, as long as you belong to the church, you'll be fine. Those are doctrines of devils. Amen. Even in, in, in churches, some of the uh, Bible preaching churches some of the doctrines the devil will, will tell, especially young people, is you have plenty of time to see, be saved and to serve God. As uh, Brother Daniel, I've knocked on the doors the last few weeks. Oftentimes we've come across a young man. And when we've talked to him about being saved, they kind of smile at, you know, I've, I've got years, decades to think about that. Really? Really? The Bible says in, in the newspaper's report that most people die suddenly. They don't know how long you've got. The Bible says you should serve God and be saved today. So there are doctrines of devils. And maybe you can come up with more of them. And there's plenty of them out there. About not trusting the word of God. About not trusting Jesus. About trusting religion and the establishment. More than the word of God. The important thing to realize is that we are in the last days. And as we see these things all around us. We know this is the last days. I remember uh, being a young Christian in the 1980s. The 1980s. I don't know if uh, 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 Ross, you were even born in the 1980s. I don't know. But I remember being a young Christian in the 1980s and purchasing a book. 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming Back in 88. Yeah. You know what happened? He didn't come back in 1988. But I was so sure. I remember being a young Christian and saying, Oh, I want to get married and have a family. Lord, don't come back yet, please. The Lord didn't come back in 1988. Or 1990. Or in the 2000s. But I do believe this. We are closer now than we have ever been. Much closer now. I believe that we are imminently on the cusp of his return. Look at the world. Look at the politics of the world coming together. Look at the the wars going around in in, in, in all the different countries. And Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places. And we see all of this. And more than anything else, and I believe one of the biggest signs is the fact the Lord Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. And that's where we are. And Noah, everybody did their own thing. Whoever they did, with whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and there was no judgment. That's where we are today. There is no right and wrong. There is no absolute truth. But thank God there's still a Bible. Thank God there's still a group of Christians. And I meant to say this earlier. But I'll I'll say it again. It is true that there will be in the last days. Those who shall depart from the truth. But thank God there will be those who stay with the truth. Amen. Amen. God has always had a people. In every situation, in every century. In fact, that Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against us. In some of the worst conditions, I think, of, and there's a film in, uh, uh, about Uganda. Uh, some of us will remember a guy called Idi Amin. And Idi Amin was a, was a wicked dictator who went around in, in, in Uganda and killing Christians. And yet in the midst of all that, there was a group of Christians who held by the stuff. We can concentrate on those who... Believe perverse things. Those who leave the church. But thank God for those like you and I. Who stay with the truth. These are the last days. Let's be faithful. 
Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray, Lord, you bless us, word to our hearts. Help us to be busy in these last days, Lord, that we might be active and bring glory and honor to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a song as we dismiss this morning. We'll sing number 310.